We have a quorum. Uh, we're going to hear two bills today, uh, Senate Bill 935 and Senate Bill 1253. Um, if you're coming up to testify, please fill out your witness form, and we'll start with Senator Rader. Go ahead whenever you're ready, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Senator Holly Thompson Rader and um, from Southeast Missouri. I appreciate you guys hearing this bill. This bill was is something that was derived from a conversation that myself and a couple other senators had with OA last year because we wanted to find out how we could be helpful to OA in in the the turnaround time on contracts, on getting those resolved, getting them awarded out the door. Um, and so as we work through different issues, this is one of the thing and it, that, you know, could have saved one contract six months actually from being finalized. And so what this bill does is it allows um, some of the negotiated terms and conditions to happen after choosing the award E that way they're not going through all of the negotiations with everyone who has applied and um, that probably doesn't make any sense to you guys because I realize I'm doing a terrible job of explaining this however we do have someone from OA that's going to be able to give us the nitty-gritty Thank you. Any questions for Senator Rusty? Go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Senator, for bringing this forward. Um, I'm glad a few of you sat around and talked about this. Slowly, as I get here and start to gain a little more knowledge, and remember, I started at a pretty low level, and I'm talking about the process. It seems to me like over the years, the way it's been explained to me, we've taken authority for departments all over years ago to be able to negotiate, pick their own contractors, and we squeeze all that through OA now, and I'm one of the people who gets frustrated with OA, right? right. Talk about, it, but the, the funnel starts out this big at the top, and we squeeze it down, and then again, we don't want to allow them to hire employees, et cetera, to be able to do that, so I thank you for bringing this possible fix, and we'll see if we can help get that done. Thank you. Right, and that's exactly what the problem has been, and a lot of the times um, we've, we've made it harder on some of the things that we have passed because then, you know, just like when, when we started with the redacting, then that is something that takes hours upon hours upon hours of their work on top of what they were already doing. So we seem to keep adding to their time frame, and um, hopefully we've got a couple of fixes in the works, including this bill, that will um, get that back manageable for them. Any other questions for Senator Rear? Seeing none, anybody else testify in, in favor of uh, Senate Bill 1253, please come forward. Hi, Hanna Swan with the Office of Administration. Um, so as Senator Rader was explaining, um, essentially one of the things that we identified as we were looking through ways to improve uh, procurement turnaround times is that right now the way an RFP is set up, it will list out the things that you will score on, the pricing, the vendor's experience, things of that nature, and we have standard boilerplate language for things like liability, um, acceptable forms of insurance, um, things like that. And so those right now are, if we, if we were to get, let's say, for a complex IT procurement like the new ERP, if we were to get all of the bids back and we were to evaluate them based on um, the things listed in the RFP for actual scoring, but um, one of the vendors, maybe the, the one that we would like to choose based on the price and based on their experience, is offering something slightly different than our language on liability we would have to go and negotiate with every single vendor that bid on the project and so like for the erp there were eight vendors and it took months 
of time to go through with all of the lawyers for all of the different um, vendors that bid to get an agreement on liability. And so what we would like to do, sorry, I'm talking too fast. <laughs> what we would like to do is be able to score the evaluations and say we will just negotiate liability and things that are um, non-scoring in nature with just the winning vendor and if we're not able to get an agreement then go to the second rather than having to drag all of the vendors through that when they're not actually um, even necessarily going to be awarded the project. So for complex IT procurements that could save months of time potentially. And we've talked some to the vendor community about this and typically they don't like being dragged through these negotiations when they're not actually going to be um, awarded the contract either. So it would save time and trouble both for the vendor community and for um, the state. And if you have any questions. Any questions? Senator Beck, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So um, I just want to try to get this clear. Um, so this would be, it would be at your, you could or could not after your post award do these negotiations with a vendor? Right, so this isn't something that we would use for standard commodity type purchases. This would typically be something that would help us with very complex procurements where licensing or liability become big sticking points with vendors. Um, and we would like to be able to, ne to negotiate with the winning vendor, a single vendor, rather than every single vendor that bid on something. Okay. Would this also impact at all construction type projects? No, this, this, this would not impact our construction purchases. Those are through Chapter 8. Under FMDC, this is Chapter 4. So these would be okay. um, goods and services type commodities. This would not be construction. Okay. Um, and then what, what is the criteria of what you can negotiate? I know it says that was not in your bid, but what is the criteria of what would be negotiated after the fact? So if when purchasing put out the RFP, they would list in the RFP which items would be subject to post award negotiation in the RFP so that everyone would know that up front. And it would be things like um, contractor liability, acceptable forms of insurance, um, pot potentially licensing or HIPAA provisions, things that would not impact the actual evaluation or scoring, where we would just need to get to a place where we were in agreement with the vendor. Would there, so I don't want to like leave an open-ended list because I could see this being misused for other purposes um, down the road. Would it be a possible to have a list that was concise of what those post-award negotiations? Because if we do this, I could see some things being used later on down the road that would not be, uh, I don't think would be satisfactory. Some others might in this, in this body might, but uh, I, I wouldn't want it to be used for political purposes is what I'm trying to get at. I understand. Um, these. These would never be um, political type. These are going to be just the, so right now when we put out an RFP, we have really standard language that says this is how liability works, this is how insurance works, and we list those things out. And we will say that those would be the items that would be potentially subject to post-award negotiation um, rather than, because those are right now seen as all or nothing. Like there, there's parts of a, when you're making, an award where you're compliant or non-compliant. And so if we, we don't right now have to negotiate, but we would say in order to be, have, be a compliant bid, we need you know these things that's kind of an all or nothing. Um, and so if we want to negotiate right now on those types of things, we have to do it with everyone. And, and I'm, I think I'm in agreement with what you're trying to do here if it stays within a certain realm, but I think it, since it's not spelled out, we don't know what that would be. With, it depends on the administration. It depends on some other folks doing the purchasing well, process. Right. And not, like I said, not all procurements would even have these types okay. of, of li like, for example, if you're just buying standard commodities, office furniture, things of that nature, this doesn't come up. Yeah. Uh, but we do have standard language for our IT procurements. And if you want a, a complete list of what types of things that w would be included in this that are typically listed in the RFP, we could get that to you. I appreciate it. Maybe I'll uh, th try to think this through a little bit. Thanks. Yep. Senator Serpo, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. I'm just curious because it sounds to me like the insurance and some of the stuff you're talking about would p be part of the evaluation criteria. This says it cannot be part of that evaluation criteria. So those are not part of the evaluation criteria. When we're evaluating a winning bid, we might say 
these are our standard conditions for liability. These are our standard requirements um, for certain things. But what we're actually evaluating a winning vendor on will be things like um, how much it's going to cost, what type of experience they've had, and we list in the RFP how the scoring will work. So things like insurance and liability are never part of the actual scoring for how you get points as a contractor when you're bidding on an RFP. So is there a list of what is considered um, the evaluating criteria? Um, does every RFP have the same six or eight or 10 or 12 or 15 they, evaluating criteria? They might vary somewhat um, for different types of procurements, but mm -hmm. all, there we do have like standard scoring for that. It's listed in the RFP. This is how you get points. Um, and, and we could share like okay, this afterward negotiations that's outside of this area that you're talking about. Is that public also or is that private? I mean, if the competitors think they're getting hosed, can they see what you're doing with this contractor you've picked, or is that private negotiation? So the, all of the criteria that go into the actual, um, all of the information is public once an award is made. And so um, in terms of contractor liability or any of those things, they could, they could see what we came to. Um, so, uh, uh, so following uh, Senator Beck's thought, if this gets carried away a little bit, your competitors then would see once the bid was awarded that they got that something didn't happen that was quite right and they'd have a recourse then to, to address that? Correct. I mean, we have, a, we have a process if a vendor, once we make an award, all of the information about that award and how the proposals were scored is public and there, there is a process for um, vendors to protest if they think that there is something that happened that was unfair or that they didn't have an equal treatment in the system and and we do evaluate those that it is a good process to be able to make sure that we didn't make a mistake and how okay. we were evaluating all right thank you thank you Mr. Chairman. any other questions seeing none thank you for your testimony anybody else testify in favor please come forward Good morning mr chairman dave Wynn here on behalf of maximus uh, it's a large corporation that operates in um, every state in the country as well as uh, the federal at the federal level do services and do some IT work and um, th this would not change the structure of how we're competitive or not competitive because all of the key components that are used to score is is the last witness said those are all subject to the same set of requirements it's all transparent we, you know, we go through the same process. If we have a question about qualifications or anything else, that goes out to every single vendor. If we think that um, there's something wrong with the, the RFP itself structurally, that goes out to every single vendor. This is the technical detail stuff that goes in where everybody has to have these things. Every state is different in how they do their liability insurance where you want the where you want the company to operate you know does it have to be in jefferson city does it need to be somewhere else can it be in michigan and help so all those things are different and those are all things that really are not material to whether we're competitive or good or not it lets us focus in on the things that matter and if you know the state thinks that we're the best or we're we're likely to be best then we have to fulfill all the other requirements that go along with that and those are generally going to be different from state to state and so this this will absolutely cut the time off and it will also make a difference to the corporations that are bidding on these in terms of our ability to know you know here's the limited amount of work that we do to submit our best opportunity and then if that looks good to the state then we can make sure that we're doing all the other things so th th we think this this will definitely cut down that time any questions seeing none oh senator beck go ahead and this bill actually says if the negotiations don't go forward, if they cancel it and they go back to the next bid. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I think that would be the practice in general, and I think that's the practice now. So for if, if, if my company gets selected for something through a competitive bid process, and for whatever reason we can't comply, you know, we don't sign the agreement, um, then OA doesn't have to go straight back to the drawing board. They can go to the next bidder. If for yeah. some reason we say, oh, you know, we just lost that whole division, for example. So we no longer can provide that service. Would you see an issue if we just spelled out what that criteria is on the post negotiations here from, for, you know, maybe to ally my concerns or, or you know, and keep those? We would, um, Senator, we understand people yeah. being, 
our purchasing laws are in place to protect from right, right. fraud, corruption, all these things that folks are worried about. We understand but they also become extremely yeah. cumbersome at some level. And to Senator, um, I think to Senator Serpoy's point earlier that I can tell you as somebody that represents multiple clients that bid on things in this state all the time, when we lose, we are absolutely looking at who won, how they won, how we stacked up against them, not, not just from the standpoint of how do we make ourselves better, but also, like, was there something that happened there that we would like to have explained? And challenges happen all the time to those. Whatever you all do with the bill, anything you can do to streamline that process, to shorten that window up, we would appreciate greatly. We think the bill probably gets to the point of having non-material issues segmented out for this, but, but if, you know, whatever, whatever language yeah. you all think is, is right. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? Anybody testify in opposition? Anybody for informational purposes? That concludes the hearing. Thank, thank you, you so much. And, um, and one of the things that was mentioned when we were going through this was that a lot of companies, when they're, when they're in these negotiation and then they, they have to get their attorneys involved, so they've put their bid in, then because of the insurance or whatever, they have to get their attorneys involved. And then when you're doing that with all of the companies, all of those companies are out of money when only one of them might have been way ahead of the other. So thank you so much. Thank you for your trust, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, now here, uh, Senate Bill 10, 1017? 935. 935, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Mike Burns Getter, Senate Bill 935. Um, this uh, bill, is, what we're trying to do is just ensure employer, employers have a consistent workers' compensation policy related uh, to marijuana. Right now, you, you know, it, it deals with uh, alcohol <coughs> and um, non-prescribed controlled drugs, and so we're just adding marijuana to that list. And I have uh, experts here that would uh, testify in favor of it, but if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Questions? Seeing none. Uh, first person uh, testifying in favor, please come forward. Please leave your witness form and let us know who you are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senators. Uh, my name is Brad Young, and my law practice is devoted to the defense of employers and workers' compensation claims. And this has become a problem in the workplace since marijuana was legalized in 2022. Let me explain. Under Section 287.120, workers' compensation benefits can be reduced for an injured worker who tests positive, and the wording of the statute states when they test positive for alcohol or a non-prescribed controlled substance. After November of 2022, marijuana then did not fit in either of those categories. It's neither alcohol nor is it a non-prescribed controlled substance under Missouri law. So as of November of 2022 then, it became, in theory, we don't have case law on this yet, but in theory it became now that, that a person could be actively using marijuana on the workplace, be injured on the job, and the reduction of benefits that happens as a punishment would not apply to an injured worker who was tested positive for marijuana at the time of the accident. So the purpose of SB 935 is to close that loophole because in, as of November of 2022, that loophole was created. This will close that loophole and will, in essence, treat marijuana exactly like alcohol, meaning uh, if they, if they uh, test positive for that at the time of the accident, their benefits can be reduced and uh, it doesn't give marijuana a preferential treatment, which it, it actually enjoys right now, 
because of the loophole created by the legalization of marijuana. So I am appearing here today in support of SB 935, and I would welcome any questions you may have regarding the application of SB 935. Thank you. Um, so the alcohol test uh, for an employee tells you they're under the influence of alcohol, does it not? Well, there's actually, Mr. Chairman, there's, there's a two-tier analysis of alcohol. Uh, everyone knows, anyone who's watched Law and Order knows that at .08 is the, is the listing, right, for alcohol. And so if someone tests above .08 blood alcohol content, then their benefits are forfeited because there is an assumption that that person is impaired under state law. But even if a person tests below 0 .8, 0 .08 alcohol, the benefits are reduced by 50%. Uh, and the idea there is, is that even though they're not impaired, then if they're below 0 .08, there's still it's going to be a punishment to the injured worker for coming to work uh, with a controlled substance or with alcohol in their system. And so when you look at it as it applies to the marijuana situation, since there's still some uncertainty in the science about what meets the level of impairment for marijuana, uh, this essentially, this bill, SB 935, treats marijuana just like alcohol below 0 .08. In other words, benefits cannot be forfeited. An injured worker still receives all of his or her medical care, uh, benefits when they can't work and they get checks at home, and a final settlement at the end for any permanent partial disability. So instead of treating uh, marijuana like above 0 .08, which would forfeit benefits, this treats marijuana as if it's like alcohol below 0 .08, meaning there's no forfeiture and only a reduction in benefits. But even if you're testing below 0 .08, that means you drank last night, this morning, Correct. something. You might have done a gummy three weeks ago, and it has no effect at all on your employment or your activity at work. It seems to me there's kind of a a problem there with legalizing something and and I know people my age that do gummies and uh, has no effect on what they do but if they tested they sure because mm -hmm. because as far as I know the marijuana testing is not as far as under the influence it's just it's in your system and you've ingested it sometime in the last three days three weeks three months and that seems to be problematic you're right senator that would be problematic were it not for section 287.120.3 under that section of the Missouri Workers' Compensation Act, a judge must find that the controlled substance in the person's body at the time, or if SB 935 is passed, it would include marijuana. If there's marijuana in their system at the time of the accident, then that marijuana, according to section 120.3, 287, 120.3, that substance would have to be the proximate cause of the injury. And so a judge would have to make a finding that the substance in their system was the proximate cause of causing the accident. So in your situation, Mr. Chairman, where you mentioned someone did gummies three days ago, a week ago, three weeks ago, then even if there's some trace amount in their system, by no means could some trace amount ever rise to the level of the proximate cause of the injury, which is required under Section 287.120.3. So therefore, we have a built-in mechanism already in place to make sure that the situation that you're concerned about never happens. Well, how because far a judge the, can make that ruling. And I'm not really that, that up to date on, on workers' comp stuff, but when do you get before a judge for that kind of mm -hmm. decision? Because early on it's just, it's just a ALJ or a, some, some um, bureaucrat that makes that decision. Would they by default make the decision that they were under the influence until a judge looked at the evidence many months later and said, no, this was not part of the problem? Well, what would happen, Mr. Chairman, is that when it goes before an administrative law judge, uh, then that judge would have to make a finding that whatever marijuana is in their system was the proximate cause of the injury. And then that would be subject to review by the Missouri uh, Industrial Relations right. Commission, mm -hmm. and that would also be up for review by the Missouri Court of Appeals. So if there was a trace amount of of THC or a trace amount of marijuana metabolites in a person's system. Mm -hmm. And if a judge erroneously made the decision that this was the proximate cause, then that would be subject to multiple levels of review, including but not limited to the Missouri Court of Appeals and ultimately the Missouri Supreme Court. Okay. So there's already built in mechanisms to ensure that the situation you described would not happen. Okay, and testing does show the amount so a judge ALJ could make that decision. I mean, is there? I'm just trying to think. If a guy, if I'm an ALJ sitting there, 
is there some way to make that determination or is the default just that it was a problem and you move on let somebody else worry about it or is no, there the, the judge would have to make the finding that it's the proximate cause and and legally speaking the proximate cause is a legal definition of art that means the primary or the uh, uh, predominant cause of the injury and so some finding of trace amounts of metabolites from gummies uh, after a Super Bowl weekend uh, would never rise to that level okay thank you other questions Senator Beck. So, <clears throat> good morning. So, good morning. This is an interesting subject, and um, I'm probably one of the few people here that was actually been subject to uh, drug tests since the, the, the 90s, since we had a union contract, and we would get a random test, and there was certain. You too. There you go. Dude, there's I'm another. I'm drug test. There. <laughs> we did it a lot and and took the and took the breathalyzer too and all that stuff so um and at that time um marijuana was illegal so you basically could have no traces of that in your system whatever it was we had a 15 panel i think it was drug test or 10 or 15 something like that um so i have a couple of questions for you is one that that i know about this and uh, i'm going to tell you i'm drug free today so but uh um don't know why, because this building maybe causes causes people to use drugs. But um, the things I the, the problems I have with what you just kind of went around and said was one: Are these folks going to have to hire a lawyer now and 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 go through a judge? I mean, how does that all work? Here's exactly how it works, Senator Beck. It any time a workers' compensation claim is filed, that individual automatically hires an attorney to file a formal claim. Yeah. And in any situation where there's going to be, for example, hypothetically, and I've had many cases that fall under this category, uh, mostly up to this point has been with alcohol, I've had some with marijuana, I've also had some with uh, cocaine and heroin. In those situations when benefits are reduced, the administrative law judge and the claimant does not have an attorney, the administrative law judge specifically says to the claimant, uh, you know, Mr. Worker, Ms. Worker, you need to go out and hire an attorney for this claim. And so in every situation, they would already have uh, counsel by the time a claim for compensation is filed with the Division of Workers' Compensation. So those three other drugs that you just mentioned, you're, you, when you take that test, you are impaired at that time, right? Correct. So this is not the case with this. We don't know about marijuana because marijuana depends on how you get the test. If it's a blood test, it would be 24 to 48 hours in your mm -hmm. blood. If it's a urine, it's 1 to 30 days. If it's saliva, it's 24 to 72 hours, and hair, it's 1 to 12 months. Mm -hmm. But exactly because we don't know what level of impairment is, under the Missouri Work Comp Act, the idea of impairment means if you are impaired, then you forfeit your benefits. That's exactly what it means. But you were talking about reduction in benefits. Right. As, so the, as you go down the scale, as the amount of THC, you're saying you get a reduction in benefits. Is that correct? Is that what? You're... Well, in theory, with subject to two things. So Senator now it's a, it's a theory. Subject, subject to two requirements, okay. Senator Beck, and let me explain those, and I can address your question. First of all, when you have it below 0.08, we all know that 0.08 is the level of impairment for alcohol, but our current act as it stands today states that if you have less than 0.08, meaning by definition you're not impaired. Down then, to 0.04, I believe, right? No, there is no, it doesn't say in the statute. It's, it's below 0.8 is the way the statute reads under section okay. 287.120. If you're not impaired, there still could be a reduction in benefits. In other words, impairment equals forfeiture of benefits. There's nothing in Senate Bill 935 that requires any forfeiture of benefits because the state of the science for marijuana means we don't exactly know the level of impairment. So impairment is not addressed in this bill in any way. So, but this, what this bill also does is the person that say, uh, takes, takes one of these gummies to go to sleep on a Saturday, they come into work on Monday, they have an accident, they, they now have to get a lawyer, they now have to do all these other things. Well, they would get a lawyer anyway because you have to have a lawyer to file a claim for compensation. And so that, that would be done whether or not they ate the gummies or not, whether or not the benefits are reduced or not. They would have to hire an attorney to file a claim. As you well know from your, from your union practice, uh, the unions have a, have a built-in structure for referring union members out to claimants' attorneys, and that's a very common practice. And so in that instance, Senator Beck, they would already have an attorney. But in the, in the example, specific example you mentioned, 
If somebody had gummies to go to sleep on Friday or Saturday, then got hurt on Monday, because the THC would be at such a low level, would it still be in their system? Yes. Okay. Could there be a legal finding that it was the proximate cause for causing the injury? Absolutely not. And as I mentioned to the chairman's question, you would have multiple levels yeah. of appeal up to and including the U.S. Supreme Court, I mean the uh, Missouri Supreme Court, that could review to make sure that no one would re have a reduction of benefits in the absence of that finding that it's the proximate cause. So I, I will also say that the vast majority of workmen's comp, I'm not trying to talk forever here, but the vast majority of uh, workmen comp cases, especially with union ones, never rise to the level of a lawyer and, and they're, they're taken care of and things are, it's only when there's contested and some other things. This here will, will, will increase exponentially the amount of cases that will have to go through the system. Well, with, with, all, with all due respect, Senator Beck, that's simply not the case, and I'll tell you why. In the, in the vast majority of workers' compensation situations where a worker <clears throat> has a very minor injury, they receive care, they might miss two or three days from work, you're absolutely correct. In those instances, they don't have attorneys because there's no negotiation of a settlement at the end of the case. But in the vast majority, when I say vast, I'm, I'm saying 90 percentile plus of situations where someone receives a settlement at the end of their case, they always have an attorney. Even union yeah. members have attorneys. And, and what I'm just going to just say here, and then this is my last comment, is is I would probably be okay with this if there was an actual test that showed impairment at the time of the injury, but there isn't. And uh, the, when that day comes, maybe you, re, you know, address this stuff. But right now, this would not be fair to anybody that uses outside of, out of that, and they could use every day or whatever the case is. I don't know. But it doesn't have any effect on your work habits. And, and I've been around people, trust me, that, that have been impaired by different things. And I, I want to have a, serve, a safe work environment. But this here, this particular law does not help with that. Well, if I could just address that concern with one final statement, Senator Beck, is this. As the law stands right now, if someone is not impaired on alcohol and they would test positive at .04, they would not be legally impaired, but their benefits would still be reduced. Without Senate Bill 935, you could have someone who is on tested positive for marijuana is not impaired under your definition, but then they wouldn't have their benefits reduced. So in essence, in the absence of Senate Bill 935, People who use marijuana are treated more favorably than people who drink alcohol. So I, so I want to say this is clearly when that person tests at .04, say, in the morning or whenever they had their accident, mm -hmm. they came to work impaired. They came to work with alcohol in their system. You can't say that about the person with marijuana. Def definitely, you can't say that. You can't define that because it could have been from a week ago. So that's the difference. That's the difference. And thank you. Well, well I, I, I'm sorry. I have one final statement on that, Senator, and that's this. When you do drug testing, you've seen how drug testing works. You even talked about your own experience with drug testing. Uh, there's a difference between what's called THC and THC metabolites. And if someone did gummies four days ago, they would test positive after a work injury for metabolites, but they would not be testing positive for THC. Those are two completely different things. And so we can know from a drug test, if there's only metabolites, then there is no impairment whatsoever. And under the law, that person could never have their benefits reduced. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, sir. Anybody else speaking in favor? Please come forward. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Ray McCarty, President of Associated Industries of Missouri, and want to go on record in support of this. I would point out that even the constitutional amendment that passed uh, for the recreational marijuana did make two very, <clears throat> excuse me, strong uh, statements that it's not allowed in the workplace. And so all we're trying to do is kind of future proof the work comp law to make sure we provide for that. And I'm happy to answer any questions, although you had the expert sitting here just a moment ago. Ray, um, I'm just curious. Um, so is this, just sitting here thinking, it seems like a law like this would have been called for 15 years ago, but it seems like now that we've legalized it, it's just, uh, there's some issues well, like this. Well, it's under the, under the strict reading of the law today, mm -hmm. um, you could say that marijuana is still a controlled substance at the federal level. Mm -hmm. It is. But what we're preparing for is if 
the federal government legalizes it as we have done here in the state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. we, there are a number of states that have legalized marijuana. Right. So you can kind of see that on the horizon. Right. So we're trying to prepare for that because then it would be a legal drug. It would not right. end. So we want to treat it like our other legal drug that's very popular. Well, I know the police department struggle with this too because there's alcohol testing is much easier and clearer. If that's they ever come up with a test that shows impairment, I think that would solve all these problems. But, right, um, and that's the important distinction here. We're not, not trying to get to impairment. We're trying to say if it's in your system, then you look and see was it the proximate cause of the injury. Right. If it was, then you have that reduction of benefits. Okay. If it wasn't, then it's nothing. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Anybody else in favor, please come forward. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Philip Arnzen with the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And we'd like to go on the record in support. As the previous witnesses had mentioned, this is there to provide clarity, um, especially moving forward um, in the case of uh, where a judge or somebody may conclude that it is uh, marijuana is no longer a non-prescribed controlled substance. Um, and then a bigger concern is if it is the federal government legalizes it and says it's no longer a controlled substance, then we have an, uh, employers have an even larger concern uh, that it would not, they would not be able to take marijuana into account if there is a workplace accident in relation to workers' comp. Thank you. Questions? Uh, thank you, Phil. Thank Next, you. in favor, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, senators, uh, Steve Hobbs, Missouri Association of Counties, and the Missouri Association of Counties Work Comp Trust Pool. We insure about 13,000 lives. Uh, for county uh, employees and elected officials here in the state of Missouri, testifying in favor of Senate Bill 935. Counties, just like other businesses, are struggling right now to try and adapt to the new laws that are in place right now. Uh, one of the questions that was brought up here is that, you know, uh, well, this would have been good 15 years ago. To be honest with you, though, with the uh, introduction of medical marijuana and then recreational marijuana, the use of these uh, substances become very, very much more prevalent. You can tell that whether, whether you're staying at your hotel or going to a restaurant in any city. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out how to deal with all of this. We insure deputies, we insure jailers, we insure people that are on, on the roads driving vehicles are our road and bridge employees are all CDL operators, and that's governed under federal law, and there is a zero tolerance for that. And so the clarity that this bill brings will help us negotiate through this as we go to the future because it's, it's, a, it's a daunting task for us to see how to work through this whole process. Thanks. Yeah, answering questions. Thanks, Steve. Uh, are these plans that you're a part of, are, have their costs gone up? Have you noticed an increase in costs? Is that what's driving this? Yeah, we, we're seeing a lot of increases in costs. Of course, work comp by its very nature is based on salaries mm -hmm. and because you're paying out for the lost time for that employee. So we've seen salaries increase greatly in all of our counties, just like we have in, in industry where we're having to pay more. So the amount of claims have gone up, yes. Uh, we are not seeing it yet uh, for marijuana use, just quite frankly, because a lot of our counties are put in a terrible position right now where they're probably just dropping the panels on the, dr on the random drug testing because they don't know how to handle this situation. Right. And even if they have a zero drug uh, policy at work, uh, we also have uh, policies where you, your, your employees are required to wear seat belts and we regularly pay out claims, huge claims where no. individuals weren't wearing their seat belts. So. Okay, thank you. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thanks, Steve. Thank Any, anybody else in favor, please come forward. Anybody in opposition? Thank you. Anybody for information purposes? Senator, do you have any closing comments? Yeah, you know, just like Steve just said, we're just looking for to clarify some of these worker compensation uh, related to marijuana. So, uh, thank you for the time. Thank you. Are we done? Kidding? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>